Um, like most crews, uh, we flew into the Kennedy Space Center about three days ahead of launch. Um, we, uh, we still fly these T-38 airplanes, which are absolutely fantastic. It's a great form of transportation. It's a great way for us to maintain our flying proficiency. Uh, in, the, uh, in the hours leading up to launch, uh, you know, we, we, we wake up about 12 hours uh, pre-launch. They get us all suited there. There's everybody with a bright smile on their face. Of course, Sandy Magnus right there, I'd like to recognize her. She can't be with us because she's actually on the space station right now. She's uh, scheduled to come back on STS-119 here uh, uh, next month. There's our mystery crew member. I believe that, I believe that was Steve Bowen back there. Uh, it was a beautiful, uh, beautiful afternoon during the walkout. Uh, as we had said, it was a 7.30 evening scheduled launch. Uh, that is not a retouch photo. That is just how breathtaking the site was as the moon came up behind the orbiter. Uh, they got us strapped in in, uh, in plenty of time. And actually, it was, it was a very uh, smooth count, no problems. We had a little glitch near the end. I think they found a, a door in the, uh, uh, in the access arm that was un unpinned. Right, but, uh, uh, okay, Fergie, vehicle's in good shape. The weather's beautiful. And so on behalf of the entire shuttle launch team, good luck, Godspeed, and have a happy Thanksgiving on orbit. Kudos to your team, Mike. It's uh, our turn to take uh, home improvement to a new level uh, after 10 years of international space station construction. And it was ready to go. Copy that. Thank you, sir. Endeavor OTC, close and lock your visors and initiate O2 flow. That is in work. All right, we'll do it. Get a quick comp check. this little ring and it was to the people that were watching it down at the launch they said it was really spectacular and you can kind of see it there in the video. This is an interesting <laughs> perspective of the solid rocket booster sitting on the solid rocket boosters that separates from the external tank and the ride it's amazing that that occurs about two minutes into the launch and it's amazing how the ride really smooths out and now as we're continuing up to orbit the, the G's are, are continuing to continue and then we hit what's called main engine cutoff where all of a sudden you, you, you feel weightless. And here's separation right after we had that Miko main engine cut off. And if you look at the back of the orbiter, you'll see a camera that we have installed in the, in the aft section that's going to take some pictures of the tank, and we download those later in the day to take a look at it. Of course, once you get on orbit, you only have a few seconds to look out the window. And it's amazing. The sun comes up right away uh, on this night launch because you're, you see a sunrise sunset every 90 minutes. Here the doors are coming open, and then you can see on the, the sides there the radiators. We've got to get right into the burns for rendezvous and docking. We dock two days after we get up onto orbit. And we also do, on flight day two, robotic work. You can see the arm there on the right side. And here we're repositioning the arm to look at the nose cap on the front of the orbiter. And we do inspections on both uh, flight day two and then after we undock, uh, just to make sure the vehicle's ready to come back in. We're going to show you now a scene here coming up, showing us going to rendezvous and docking. Hope you like the music. Uh, next to the space station, just incredible sight. Uh, I thought that I could stay there forever. I was having a great time, but I have to admit that uh, uh, I was happy to see them. Um, I knew they were going to be my ride home. board Very Mike good. and uh, Larry and I to welcome everybody you know with uh, three on board the space station it's just a massive volume it's an incredible space uh, now and, and now with 10 on board it's uh, gonna be a lot more activity but great to see everybody come in and see their eyes wide open as they saw how spacious the space station was now especially with the Japanese module and, and Columbus up there 
we brought up this cargo container, which is passionately referred to by us folks at NASA as the MPLM. And we moved this cargo container from the payload bay of the space shuttle uh, and berthed it onto the side of the space station using the Canadian robotic arm. And then we could open up the hatch and start to offload all, this, uh, all these go goodies that, that we brought on board uh, in, the, in this cargo container. And some of the goodies included these full-size space station racks, which are about the size of a large upright freezer. And they can weigh upwards of a half a ton. And uh, we, we can move these around uh, just using fingertip pressure and float them into place on the space station. Now, we brought up a, a suite of racks which uh, together make up our advanced life support system for space station. And this starts off with a new toilet which uh, goes, which is plumbed into a urine processing rack. And this urine processing rack can make potable water out of, uh, um, well, you can figure out what it makes potable water out of. <laughs> and then we brought up a new galley rack. And then the uh, output from the urine processor rack then goes into the galley rack. So together, the, these suite of racks make up what we call the, the coffee machine because uh, it has the uncanny ability to take yesterday's coffee and make it into today's coffee. <laughs> and there's some assembly required, and as any uh, complex piece of equipment with serial number 001, uh, it takes a while to get it going. Uh, here we are with some of yesterday's coffee and some of today's coffee. Uh, <laughs> And this is important technology when you go out into the solar system because it's a, a nearly an anhydrous environment and we're going to have to be able to take care of our water. And now on orbit we also have paperwork to do and here we are keeping track of all these items that we have to transfer. And while Don was busy um, inside doing all that work with the MPLM, um, we had a lot of work that we had to do outside, um, primarily getting the um, solar alpha uh, rotary joint back into operation. Um, but before we got into tackling the Sarge, um, our first task on EVA-1 was to go out and just move some um, big components um, that we had brought up and, and bring back a, a spare nitrogen tank. So it was, for me, it was kind of neat because I got to be on the end of the robotic arm, although most of the time I was holding this big blivet, so it kind of limited how much you could look around. Um, but then it was time to get out onto the Sarge. Um, it had an awful lot of work to do out there, and it was very tedious work. Um, it had to take off a cover or took off a series of covers, removed a trundle bearing, got uh, the grease guns out that we had to clean them up with and, and scrape off um, some, a lot of the debris. Because what had happened on the Sarge is the, um, the race ring where the bearing sits um, had a material failure. And the bearing was also, it was, that bearing surface was actually coming apart. It was flaking. And, uh, and so that was bad because it was um, increasing the, the currents. And so um, we had this, this plan to go out there and take off every section of the race ring. And so it was something that obviously you're not going to finish that in, uh, in one EVA. So uh, we did as much as we could on EVA 1, and then the plan was on EVA 2, we we're going to go back out there and do some more work. But uh, before we did that, uh, we had to do some, some prep work for the next flight, um, getting ready for uh, 119. And uh, so we just uh, got on the, Shane got on the arm and we moved the seat of carts, um, just re relocated them from one side to the other so that they can get the MT all the way out on the starboard side. Uh, we also did some uh, repair work on the arm itself. Um, you know, it's amazing, all this equipment you know, has been up there you know, over, over 10 years, we've been bringing up a lot of equipment to space station. And just like anything in your house, your car, um, you know, you, you need to do maintenance on it. And um, a lot of this maintenance, you know, are things that we just never anticipated. Um, you know, very similar to, you know, Don says when you have a one of a kind, you know, serial number 001 on the arm, then, uh, you, you know, there's things come up in orbit that you just don't anticipate it. Um, I don't think they anticipated the, the snares on the end of the robotic arm. That's what they used to grasp something. And uh, there's, that's Shane's view of, you know, he's greasing them up and putting them back into the slots because, uh, you know, they, they managed to come out over the years. And uh, so, you know, lots of, lots of folks on the ground, um, you know, come up with our repair plans. We work together, um, training in the pool, trying to get things ready um, so that we can go out there and do, do the work that we need to do. One of the things that's not always appreciated is the amount of work that the uh, IV does on the inside of the vehicle. Uh, you can see here that's Shane and Eric, and Eric 
carried it for the times that Shane was outside, and they just do an incredible amount. Outside, we basically do what they tell us. So that's pretty easy. Inside, they have to keep track of what we're doing, talk to the ground, keep track of our tools and all of our equipment. So on EVA3, when Heidi and I went out again, uh, we basically worked uh, all day and all night and all day and all night and all day and all night again. And this was a great opportunity. You just saw sunrise outside. And you can see how the color transitions as the sun comes up through the atmosphere and out to where we we're in bright sunlight. As Heidi was talking about, this is the... Uh, the work that we did, you can see as the helmet cam gets in a little closer, on the top side, you can see the damaged ring, and you can see the speckling, and the debris we were cleaning up is sort of that blob of dust right there. That's one of the larger blobs, but that stuff was distributed all the way around the ring. So our job was to clean that up as best we could and then lubricate the surfaces so there's no more wear, and it seems to have worked out pretty well. One of the difficult things about working outside, uh, in the... In the NBL, when you train, you kind of, I guess, cheat a little bit in the sense that gravity still has a vector to it pointing down. You can kind of keep things inside the bags when you put them there. That doesn't necessarily always work when you're uh, putting, packing bags to come back inside, outside, you know, in orbit. So you'll see I just put something inside there, and soon enough it'll pop back out, and I'll have to push it back in. And uh, that's not always appreciated when we're working in the NBL. Uh, I did find, however, that working in orbit was so much easier than working in the NBL because there was no gravity. And so we came back inside after EVA3. We still had a little bit of work to do out on the uh, starboard Sarge. And uh, once we finished up, once I finished up out there on EVA4 with Shane, uh, there was much rejoicing. So basically on EVA4, we went out uh, to the port side, got Shane set up to lubricate the entire port Sarge, in essence, by himself. He uh, actually went out. We pulled some covers. He lubricated the half of it. He went and installed a camera and then went back out and finished lubricating it after they rotated the, uh, the port Sarge. And then when we, once we got back inside after that last EVA, you can see Shane dropped his pants real quick. He's ready to slide right out. And then shortly after that, Chris stood on my head and pushed me out because I didn't come out quite as easy as Shane does. One of the neat diversions we had on orbit was a couple of spiders and some caterpillars so that were busy trying to do what they normally do on Earth but couldn't figure out how to do it in space. Uh, but after a couple of days, a spider figured out how to make a, a symmetric web, and it was pretty neat. Uh, caught a few flies, and we're keeping track of that. Uh, Don is kind of famous for some neat science demos, and here's one where he's... Uh, put an Alka-Seltzer tablet in some water, and after six months without any soda, um, I was wondering if maybe this was, uh, you know, Diet Coke for the, for the future in orbit. Here's a little demo uh, spinning something around its, uh, its unstable axis, which is pretty neat. And if you thought you couldn't juggle in zero-G, you can. The balls uh, don't come back. You just have to go after them. <laughs> so when we got to the space station, it's a very huge place, as you've heard mentioned, but it can also be a pretty high traffic area. So attached to node two here is what you're looking at. There's five elements attached, which is pretty amazing. So you'll see people coming out from different directions, and you'll see it looks like uh, DC traffic here in a minute. <laughs> so. A really spectacular place. You see Eric just look, working on some angular momentum, his figure, figure skating uh, talents there. And just, these are just some living in space kind of shots that we wanted to share with you. It's me riding the bike. We all tried to exercise you know, every day. It didn't happen all the time, but we tried to do that. Uh, we had a couple of good crew shots. This is our Thanksgiving dinner shot. So we all had Thanksgiving dinner on the shuttle mid-deck with the station crew as well. There's our delicious turkey and stuffing and uh, delightful meal that we had. You see Chris being a good astronaut playing with his food. I think he had some peanuts there. And Don, as, you, as a, you've already heard, is uh, quite, quite adventurous up there. He designed this coffee cup, he called it, uh, the Zero-G Coffee Cup. And he and Steve here are toasting. Um, Doing a few toasts to themselves, I'm sure. <coughs> so Eric here is putting a patch on, and what you're about to see is some great views out the uh, gym windows, which were spectacular um, windows that they had.
Flight day 13 rolled around. It was time for us to close the hatches and uh, start <laughs> heading back to Earth. So we had to make sure we got everybody on the right side of the hatch, of course. And uh, then we undock the next day. And I'll let Eric talk about the undocking phase. Should have been it. Open. Physical separation. Okay, pedals clear. BLVLH all. Physical sep, Houston. So this is one of the highlights of the mission. Another highlight that we had was to uh, undock. We undocked in the darkness, and then we time it so that at around the six to 700 point, we actually fly around the entire station, and then we come into sunlight just as we hit the 600 foot point. And you can see how beautiful the station looks. And one of the things I want to point out is notice the arrays are parallel. And that shows all the work that we did on the starboard charge, which is that single array that you see on the left side of the picture there. And as we uh, continue to fly around, got great views of the station. And one thing to note is the next flight that's coming up here, STS-119 in February, they're going to put on the final array that's going to go on the uh, outside here. So that mission's coming up shortly. One of the neat effects is, like we talked about earlier, is we get 16 sunrises and sunsets. Here you can see the, the sun is setting behind the uh, space station and the horizon just as we get ready to leave. And as we're leaving, we get, again, right back to work. We, we do another flight day inspection, and here's one of other – look on the left side of the picture here. You'll see a satellite get fired out that we also did. That was called PicoSat, and it does, it's up there right now investigating solar cell technology for the future. Now it's time to get ready to come home, and it takes a while to take the uh, spaceship that we've made into an orbital sp spacecraft. Now we're getting ready to be back to a, an aircraft so that we can land back. We were planning on going to uh, Kennedy Space Center, and we had two attempts to go there, but the weather wasn't cooperating that day, so we waved off and ended up. Here's a good shot of Shane, and you can see we're setting up to go to Edwards Air Force Base. And one of the highlights was coming back, seeing Edwards from 300 miles away uh, from the coast of California. We also landed at a runway that we hadn't gone to before, 04 left, which is an inside temporary runway, and you can see that there in the center of the picture. Yeah, it's always uh, interesting to come back to California. That's, that was my first venture, but uh, we land out there about once every year and a half uh, due to weather or other conditions in Florida, and it seems like uh, every time we, uh, we send this really impressive sonic boom over Los Angeles, uh, they forget the last time the shuttle flew over and did it. So there's, uh, the, interesting, the evening news is always interesting to watch after a shuttle landing. Um, as Eric had said, uh, this is a, um, a temporary runway. It's shorter and narrower, but it uh, works just great. Uh, the shuttle has actually only landed on a total of three different runways over the course of its entire lifetime, but it could land just about anywhere. Um, but uh, we had the opportunity to, to try this one out. I think it'll be the last time that uh, we ever actually land there. Um, it was a gorgeous day out there in California. Um, we're disappointed not to get out to Florida to see our uh, families who were eagerly waiting our uh, arrival. But uh, being a Sunday afternoon on military installation uh, in California, there's a lot less hands to shake. So uh, that's good or bad, depending upon uh, how you approach it. And that was the conclusion to, uh, to a mission that uh, we had talked about earlier as a, um, a feat that would take the space station, which before we got there was a three-bedroom, uh, one-bathroom home or an outpost uh, into uh, what are up there now are five bedrooms, uh, two bathrooms, um, a kitchen, and a, a really uh, great exercise machine that will keep the astronauts fit.